Okay, thank you everyone for joining us. So Marla, whenever you feel comfortable and you're ready, you can go ahead and get started. Thank you so much. All right, thank you um, everyone. So I said uh, already a hello to Danielle um, just now, but hello Donna as well. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, today's topic is of course going to be eat well, be healthy. And so I wasn't really sure how many people would actually be joining us today. So, you know what, with a small group that we have, um, you know, if you feel like participating, please chime in. I'd love to hear kind of, um, what you like to talk about, what healthy means to you. And as we're going through this presentation, um, you know, obviously we're going to be talking about some food and things like that, um, and different resources in the Hazelwood area. So again, Feel free to chime in. If you want to stay silent, don't worry. I got you. You got lots of really cool things to look at on my slides and for me to just keep going too. So first, let me introduce myself, right? So my name is Marla Breitbarth. Um, I am a registered dietitian and I work for Duquesne University. Um, so specifically, that's going to be in the Center for Integrative Health. So I'm the health and wellness coordinator there. So if you've seen me about in the um, community, I've only been around for the last couple months. So um, if you haven't seen me yet, then hopefully I'll be in an event soon that you will also be there um, as well. So I love everything health and wellness related. I love nutrition education. Um, again, I like to share this information. So again, a big thank you to the Center of Life for allowing me to talk today as well. Um, but basically, we're going to talk um, about several things today, but I wanted to mention real quick about what does it actually mean to be healthy, right? So we have the term wellness thrown out there a lot. And as you can see here on this slide, um, specifically this wheel, it encompasses a lot of things. So we have physical, we have mental, spiritual, emotional, social, environmental. Um, but really, I want you to think about it for a second. And if you want to share, completely fine. If you don't want to, that's okay too. Um, about what you think it means to be healthy. Now try and think of everything related to that wellness theme and pick out maybe one or two things that are most important to you. And again, you don't have to share, but you can if you would like to do that today as well about really what does that mean to you? Um, so what it means to me is that one is going to be eating well, right? We're talking all about eating well today as well. And of course, with my, my history and, and my, um, you know, profession as well, thinking about what you're putting into your body as fuel is going to be so important. Um, but also movement is going to be life. So it's important to move your body, a clear mind. So you're not really feeling stressed maybe a safe environment, um, you know, a good family and social connections. These all play a part. Um, but today, of course, I'm just going to focus on food. So hopefully, you know, in the future, we can touch upon all these different other wellness topics. Um, and I do know the Center of Life has already talked about some of these in their other workshops. And again, thank you so much. I see that um, we actually added in the uh, chat box too. So fantastic, you know, healthy and well, mind, body, soul, spiritual, mental, emotional, of course, all very important. But today we're focusing on that food. Let me switch it. There we go. So what specifically am I going to be talking about? Um, I'm going to touch upon my plate and the five food groups, uh, what to look for on a food label, eating healthy on a budget, healthy pantry staples, uh, food safety and storage, smart food choices. And then at the end, I'm gonna to touch upon some local food programs and community resources that are right there in Hazelwood. Uh, so how many of you have ever seen one of these three pictures before? You know, really taking you back maybe um, to, to the olden days, right? When we saw the dietary guidelines progress throughout the several years here. So maybe this was something that you saw in gym class or something like that. But going over here to this, um, this black pyramid, um, that actually came out in 1994. So if you can see the base of that, that's going to be the bread, the cereal, the rice and pasta group. That, um, that was the the largest chunk of what this pyramid was. And of course, as you get kind of closer to the top, you can see you should be eating less of those items. So you got fruits and vegetables second, you got your dairy and you got your meats. And then at the very top is gonna to be your fats, your oils um, and your sweets um, up there. 
Um, so then 2005, they actually switched it. So still looking like a pyramid, right? But they actually added steps on the size of that. So that's trying to incorporate physical activity um, into your, your My Pyramid. But you can still see they have it broken down kind of just in a different direction with your grains, your vegetables, fruits, milk, um, meats and beans. And that tiny sliver that is yellow um, is actually your fats, um, fats and oils too. Yeah. So again, thank you so much for putting some stuff in the chat. Yeah, I know 2011 seems like um, forever ago now or, or not, um, but 2011 was the most recent one that is now my plate. So you can kind of see the progression um, uh, of what the dietary guidelines again came about to be. So I'm going to talk just quickly about um, what the my plate would look like with half of your uh, plate as fruits and vegetables. We got grains, we got protein, and we got dairy as part of those five food groups. So um, doesn't this plate look amazing, right? So if we're looking at my plate and we're trying to make it look like real food, oh my goodness, the one on the left just looks delicious and beautiful, but whose plate actually really looks like that? Right, so over here on the right hand side, I tried to get some more photos of maybe what a real plate would look like. Again, trying to incorporate that concept of all the five different food groups and then also having the correct portion sizes. Um, so I'm just gonna spend just a few minutes here about each one of these food groups and name a few items in these groups. Um, and I know it sounds very basic, won't spend too much time here, but it is important for us to review this. Um, so as you can see, fruits as well as vegetables should make up at least half of your plate when you're thinking about a meal. So good options would include fresh, frozen, dried, or canned. Um, but when you are looking for the canned fruit, however, try and find an option that says it's canned in its own fruit juice or in water. So we want to avoid something that says it's stored in its in syrup right? Heavy syrup, light syrup, anything like that. That's just going to give us a lot more added sugars. For our vegetables, you can actually break down your vegetables into two different groups as well. So we have starchy vegetables. So those would be things like corn, peas, uh, potatoes, beans, or squash. And then of course you have all your non-starchy vegetables. So those would be all the other ones that you can think of. Maybe broccoli, tomatoes, carrots, leafy greens, cucumbers, uh, peppers, onions, like all those other ones that wouldn't be considered starchy. Again, this could be great options as fresh, frozen, or canned. Um, if you can find dried vegetables, great. You can go with those as well. Also a good option. Um, but when you're looking for your canned veggies, again, it's important to see um, what the food label says about its salt content or its sodium. We're going to be taking a look at a label here in a second. Um, but if you can't find an option that's a canned vegetable that says low sodium or no added salt, then that's perfectly fine to get the regular version. And before you eat it, you can actually rinse it underwater to get some of that um, salt off of it. So if you rinse your canned veggies before you actually either cook or eat them, um, it does help reduce the amount of salt is on them. All right, going to our grains group now. And I don't know who started this rumor, but for some reason, everybody thinks carbohydrates are bad for you. You know, carbs are bad, but that is absolutely not true. Carbohydrates are so good for you. And it just depends on which ones you're eating, right? Think about them as the fuel for your energy um, and putting that into your body and being healthy for you. Uh, but just like everything else in life, too much of one thing isn't always the best choice. Um, so a balanced diet is one where you eat a variety of everything. So you can break your grains or your carbohydrates down into two groups as well. And one would be simple carbohydrates. And think about these as sugary foods. So an example would be uh, maybe some, some cereals you, that you can think of, specifically children's cereals, very sugary, right? Or desserts or some of your baked goods. These are all simple carbohydrates. And then there's complex carbohydrates, and these are fiber rich foods. So these are going to be whole grains like oats or oatmeal, um, whole wheat bread, brown rice, um, whole wheat pasta, all of those as well are considered your grains and carbohydrates. Moving on to protein. So most people think protein is going to be the largest portion of what you should be eating when really we only need it to be a small portion. All the uh, all of the protein that we need daily. So if you look at the pictures over 
plate, right? It looks like a ham one hamburger patty and the bottom one, it could be either a piece of chicken or a piece of pork, something like that. Um, doesn't have to be huge portions. Um, and you really want to aim for lean meat cuts. So this would be poultry, like chicken or turkey. Um, eggs are going to be a great source of lean protein. Fish, you could do pork loins or pork chops. And if you're thinking about different beef options, think about ground meat and kind of the different varieties you can actually get for ground beef. Um, so when you're selecting that, see if you can find something um, that has an 80-20. So that means it's going to be 80% lean and 20% fat. Um, so you can also look for something that says 90-10 or higher as well. Um, but it's also great to include some plant proteins. So these would be things like um, beans and nuts and seeds, also great options. And really trying to think about limiting those fatty cuts of meat. So that would be bacon, sausage, um, processed meats like bologna, something like that. So try and limit those. Again, we're not cutting them out completely, just having more lean meat options. I also want to touch upon dairy. You can see in some of the pictures here, um, we got milk glasses and one looks like it's cottage cheese. Um, so dairy is also a very important food group when choosing dairy products. Um, you should really be aiming for lower fat options like the milks and the cheese and the yogurts. Um, but if you remember on my plate, it was kind of represented as a drink up there in the corner. So that's kind of why we have it situated like we do. But on this picture on the left, you can see that making water your drink of choice is listed. And very, very important, water should be the beverage of choice instead of something like soda, sweet tea, energy drinks, something like that. Okay. Oh, I, I love cottage cheese too. Um, but yes, this is basically the my plate, just a quick overview for that. But I wanna also go into the food label that I just mentioned, okay? So we just went over all the food groups, but now let's look at what it means on the back of a food label. Um, this is what the newer food label looks like. If anybody noticed that within the past year, they have actually changed slightly. So if you actually have something in your, in your pantry or your house that might uh, have been there a while, you could probably see a few differences on what an old label and a new one looks like. And it didn't change dramatically, but I wanna point out up at the top, you can see serving size is gonna be bolded, that's new. Calories are larger and also bolded, so it really sticks out at the eye. But they also added um, a line under the um, down by number three, if you can see, it's called added sugars. That one is a new addition. And then down in the very bottom, under that bolded black line, it says vitamin D, calcium, iron, and potassium. The vitamin D and potassium actually are um, new additions as, as well. It used to be vitamin A and vitamin C. So they changed that because we don't really get enough of our um, vitamin D or potassium. Um, so we have to, to make sure we're looking at those now as well. All right, so I'm just gonna do the one, two, three, four and go down briefly about each of these. Um, and when you're looking at a food label, of course, you can look at a lot of different things. And maybe one of these items is a little bit more important to you based on um, maybe any kind of health conditions you might have as well. So first and foremost, though, is going to be the serving size. So you really want to see how much is recommended to eat. And then how much are you actually eating? So this is a great um, label example. And we're going to pretend it's macaroni and cheese. Okay, so the serving size is going to be one cup. So one cup of macaroni and cheese is the suggested serving size. And that's what all the rest of those numbers are going to refer to is just you eating that one cup of macaroni and cheese. All right. So when I see the servings per container is equal to four, that means that this one box of cheese or mac and cheese could feed up to four, four people. And that's what all those additional numbers mean. So um, if you look at the calories next, then we can see that eating that one cup of macaroni and cheese is equal to 280 calories. Now say, you know, you love this mac and cheese. Maybe it's the, uh, maybe you're just going to make the whole thing your lunch, whatever the case is, you eat this entire box. So now you took the servings per, per container and you're going to have to multiply them by the calories. So actually, if you take 280 
multiplied by four. So picturing that you're eating this whole box of mac and cheese, it actually comes out to 1,120 calories, which is a lot, right? So you just ate way more calories than maybe you thought just because you ate more than the suggested serving size. So that's definitely something to pay attention to. Okay, um, moving down to number three are nutrients. Um, again, you might want to pay attention to different things based on your different health conditions, um, but the nutrients that we want to limit are going to be fat, cholesterol, sodium, and those sugars. So those are all listed on here. And the ones that we like to see a little bit higher when we're looking at a food label is going to be fiber and protein. Um, our vitamin D, our calcium, our iron, our potassium, all those good nutrients down there too. Um, so when you're, when you're looking at these two, you know, who really knows what these numbers mean, right? It says total grams of fat, nine, maybe, you know, that's high, maybe you don't, you know, if we're looking at, um, sodium 850 milligrams, you know, what does that mean? Is that high or it's not? Um, so that number, it's number four over here in purple, that's called the percent daily value. So those are the numbers that are going to tell you if this food is really high in a nutrient or not. So if it's anything less than five, five or low, or less, excuse me, it's considered low. And 20 or more percent is considered high. So if you're looking at um, this label specifically, you see sodium, it says 850 milligrams. But if you go over on the right-hand side for that percentage, it says 37%. And we're all basing this off of 100, okay? So with you eating this macaroni and cheese, just one cup, you hit 37% of the allotted sodium that you should be recommended to eat in a day, right? That number might go over 100 because you're eating a lot of that sodium or you're eating more than one serving, but we're really aiming to keep those numbers to 100%. So something that is actually high in that is good for us would be that calcium. So calcium's at 25%, which is great. So you're at least getting a great source of calcium, even though you're getting kind of some added fats and salt. All right, so I'm not sure if I made that more confusing or not, but if you have any questions um, about the food label, then, um, then we, can, we can talk about it now, or also I will be following up with some um, handouts with this too, so everybody can get some additional information after the presentation. Marla, I apologize, but um, if you already touched base on this, but you, can you talk about the difference between um, trans fat and the saturated fat when you're looking at like the labels? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um, with the trans fat and saturated fat, right? If you've ever heard that there's good fats, there's bad fats. Um, I mean, that is that is technically true. So when we're looking at trans fat, and let me let me just go back to my the other side, there we go. So if we're looking at um, trans fat, right, that is gonna be what we consider bad fat. And I really don't like to use good or bad when it comes to food, but trans fat is gonna be our bad fat. Um, and so that um, saturated and trans are on here specifically because we wanna limit those as much as possible. And I want you to think about what those different fats could be. And a really good way to do that is to think if it is solid, or liquid at room temperature. So saturated and trans fat, great examples would be butter or Crisco, um, uh, lard, you know, things like that. And then our healthier fats are called unsaturated fats. And those are gonna be liquid at room temperature. So those would be things more like oils, olive oils and canola oils and corn oils, things like that. Um, so we wanna have more of the healthy fats and less of the um, unhealthy, which would be the saturated and trans, which is very specifically why it's listed on the back of a label. Um, thank you for that question. I hope I answered it. Um, and if we have more like that, please feel free to keep them coming. Thank you. Mm -hmm. All right, so um, I know, so a little um, know-how and advanced planning, um, you can really have some nutritious, nutritious food uh, while sticking to your budget. So we're gonna talk a little bit about eating healthy on a budget and some different ways that you may be able to save um, some money and still get some of those delicious, nutritious foods. Um, so one is gonna be planning around sales. So the key to smart, budget-friendly grocery shopping is planning ahead, right? If you've ever heard that you shouldn't go um, grocery shopping when you're hungry, 
absolutely true, right? Go in with a plan and you get what you should be getting. Um, you can always check the store sales flyers and available coupons at the time. Um, and then also if you compare national brands to private store labels or any generic brands, usually there's a uh, pretty good saving just based on uh, what brand you're buying as well. And then once you identified your sale items, you can incorporate them into simple meals. Okay. Um, <laughs> yeah. So creating a shopping list is going to be next, right? Another great idea is to um, stick to it. Prioritize your food dollars for those nutrient-rich foods since it's very easy to grab impulse items like we just mentioned. Um, so keeping your grocery list from growing too long and then you can prepare meals that include similar ingredients throughout the week. So if you can plan, again, a, a great meal based on a couple items that you can reuse throughout that week, it's a great way to reduce kind of just um, how much you actually is going into your cart. Shopping seasonally. Um, so when it comes to vegetables and fruits, um, great to shop seasonally, especially local if you can do any of that as well. It's really its peak flavor. You don't have to, you know, it's not sitting on a truck somewhere for a long time and it's generally more abundant as well. So it's usually sold at a lower price. Having those frozen or canned alternatives. Um, so again, great options if you can't do fresh. I mean, you know, in the middle of winter, we're not going to get those fresh strawberries. And if you do find them, you know, they're going to be very, very expensive. So a great option is going to be finding frozen or canned. Um, and usually they are picked um, at their peak uh, ripeness as well. And then they're canned or frozen during that time. So you're really not losing any of those nutrients and those great aspects of that healthy food when you buy them like that. Again, you just want to be cautious about those added sugars or added salts in some of those um, canned items. If you're looking to extend your meat options, um, consider purchasing a larger quantity of meat that's on sale and preparing it throughout um, for two or more meals. So you can enjoy leftovers later in the week or really you could probably freeze it for you know, a, a future meal as well. Um, but because meat is usually the highest dollar amount ingredient in the recipe, you can also consider planning meatless meals several times each week, or you can try replacing half of the meat with other, um, with other food items like beans or mushrooms um, or other non-meat proteins as well. So I don't know if you've ever tried it, but if you actually have ground, ground meat, right? So you're making a hamburger and you take the entire patty and you cut it in half and you, and you save the other half of the meat and you cook up some mushrooms and you add that together, the mushrooms are meaty enough. Now this is the only if you like mushrooms. The mushrooms are actually meaty enough that you can't tell too big of a difference between the texture when everything's cooked together. So if you like mushrooms, I would, I would say you should give that a try. Mm -hmm. um, all right, so grains and dry goods as well. So whole grains and dried beans are generally inexpensive and are an easy way to get more nutrition for your buck. So if you stock up on these non-perishable items when you have a sale or maybe there's a bulk bin or something like that, um, then you can purchase in addition and you can save them because they're going to be stored for a very long time. Um, but dried beans, peas, and lentils, they're always a great option to, to keep on hand, not only because they um, last long and you can store them for a very long time, um, but they are a great source of protein and that fiber. And then the last kind of tip on here is gonna be reducing waste. So once you've done your shopping, make the most of your food spending by cutting down on waste. Um, plan to use highly perishable food items kind of earlier in the week and those heartier foods that can stay either on the counter or in the refrigerator longer, you know, you can use those towards the end of your week as well. You can have leftovers for lunches, um, you know, put those in the freezers and then even any of your cooked meats or vegetables that you have, they can kind of re be revamped in casseroles or soups, something too. So again, trying to reduce as much waste as possible um, with the food items already purchased. All right, so something that, uh, so sometimes though, we don't get to the store very often, right? I'm talking about going to the store on a weekly basis. Maybe that's not possible, right? We don't have time to prepare a meal and we gotta have something quick. So what are some good things to always keep on hand when you need something fast 
or you know you're not going to be able to get out either this week or it's going to be a little bit longer before you hit the grocery store. So these are a list of some items that you can throw together um, and make a pretty nutritious meal still while grabbing everything from your pantry. So the first one is going to be your beans, your peas, and your lentils. And I keep talking about these great source of protein and fiber. And if you're really not sure what to do with these, this is something we can either talk about more. I can send your recipes, anything like that. But those peas, lentils, and, and beans, great to have in your pantry all the time. Peanut butter or nut butters. Um, pasta sauce. And again, just kind of looking for reduced sodium options. Cans or pouches of seafood. So if you've ever seen the tuna packets, um, they also have salmon and sardines that you can choose. Canned fruit, um, again, looking for that packed in water or its own juices. Canned vegetables, remembering about the sodium, as well as the canned soup and broth, looking for low sodium options. And then your canned tomato products. So that could be whole or diced or crushed. Again, looking for lower salt. A couple more items that you can keep on hand is dried fruit. Um, so again, there's lots of different options out there for dried fruit. And if you see any that actually are almost white in color and they have a lot of the crystallized sugar on it, again, we wanna go for those whole dried fruits rather than the added sugar variety, but still good options. Any whole grain hot and ready to eat cereal. So this would be things like oatmeal, shredded wheat, uh, maybe whole wheat flakes, something like that. Um, whole grains like our brown rice, barley, buckwheat. You got whole grain pasta that could be spaghetti or shells or elbow noodles, any of those varieties. Um, whole grain crackers is a good snack. Popcorn, I love popcorn so much. And actually it is a fantastic whole grain. Um, the only thing that you wanna be cautious about is either what else you put on your popcorn or if you buy them in those pre-popping um, bags that you just stick the whole thing in the microwave, just be careful if there's extra um, salt and fat and butter and everything in those as well. And then making sure that you have dried herbs or spices, great additions to any food or dish that you're making that you could include those as flavorful ingredients rather than adding more of those salts as well. So with some or all of these um, items on hand, then you're, if you are in a rush or you're low on inventory, you can usually have a healthier options to create a balanced meal more quickly. All right, so where is it best to store certain food items and how long is it good to keep them? So I'm just gonna start over here in the pantry section up at the top, it says canned goods last about two years, but can be damaged by temperatures above 100 degrees. So hopefully nobody's um, you know, going 100, over 100 degrees um, in their pantry, but I know these last you know, few days or few weeks have been very, very warm. Um, and you can see there's mayonnaise, peanut butter, some honey, some canned goods, and some rice. But the mayonnaise specifically, um, it should be moved into the, into the fridge after it's open. So it is important that if you do stick anything in your pantry and it has that little sign or, you know, tag on it that says refrigerate after opening, make sure that you pay attention to that too, because then you want those items to go in the fridge after you use them. Um, keeping potatoes in a cool, dark place in the pantry and remove any that start to go bad. And then don't keep your onions and your potatoes together. They actually make each other ripen a little bit more quickly. So you kind of just separate them and, and just being, you know, across the counter is completely fine. Um, having your fruits with any pits, so that would be peaches and plums, if you put them in a brown paper bag, um, they actually ripen quicker as well, and then you can put them in the fridge if you want them to stop ripening, and your tomatoes can just ripen and sit on the counter as well. Going to the freezer, you know, making sure that you wrap and or label anything that you plan to freeze and save for later, so one, you know what it is, um, but also two, wrapping it so it doesn't get freezer burn. And then in the fridge, making sure your dairy and eggs should be stored at the coldest part of the fridge. Um, meat would be down at the bottom. And then if you have crisper drawers for your produce items, um, you can put those in the drawers down there. But if you don't have those drawers, you definitely don't want your meat to be thawing and dripping on those. So just make sure that you separate the fresh produce um, from anything that you would have to cook or is raw. So I wanna mention real quick an expiration date. So that actually refers to the last date a food should be eaten or used. 
Now, if you've ever seen, sometimes they have best by dates or use by dates. Those are the last date that's recommended for the use of the product while it's at its peak quality. So it doesn't always refer to a safety date about when you could eat it um, or use it, I should say, but it is kind of going to be at its best quality by then. You know, some things might get either wrinkly or they might, um, you know, start to start to smell, but they're still safe to eat. Um, and then there is the sell by date. And this tells the store how long to display the product for sale for inventory management. So again, it always doesn't refer to the safety date. So you definitely wanna pay attention to the expiration date if you can find it on a product. All right, so looking a little bit closer at food safety and cooking, um, you may think you already know this or have um, maybe you've worked in the food industry or know somebody who does, um, but food safety is so important. And I, I love talking about food safety anyways, but um, especially, you know, it's summertime, there's lots of picnics happening, there's get togethers, 4th of July just occurred. You know, you might be cooking for other people. So you wanna make food that's safe to eat as well. Um, so when you're looking at cooking temperatures, right, you can see on, on this slide here, we start down at 145 degrees with some of the steaks and the fish, pork, and then it goes up slightly for ground beef and egg dishes. And then it's the highest when we're chicken any, or cooking any chicken or whole poultry. So that would include turkey as well. Um, so the best way, of course, to check these temperatures is with a meat thermometer. But what do you do if you don't have a meat thermometer? That's not something I don't think I had in my kitchen for a very long time. And if you've ever heard the, uh, the expression, if it's pink in the middle, it's cooked too little. Now, I mean, just because it's, uh, it might not be pink in the middle though too, it doesn't mean it's 100% safe. Um, so I don't always like to use that as a, as a trick as well. Um, but really, if you're unsure about the safety of your food, I always say just cook it way more than you think is necessary. Um, now, people who are, are pretty picky about their foods and how they like their meats cooked and you know, it gets, it's not as tender, you know, I'd rather be safe then worry about that anyways, okay? Another saying is when in doubt, throw it out. Um, sometimes you can't always see or smell if it's going bad as well. So again, if you're in doubt, just end up throwing it away too. But the, uh, the highest risk foods that you just wanna be careful of is anything that is a meat or meat product, but it also includes any meat containing dishes like casserole, any eggs or egg containing foods, um, again, maybe some people really like to eat those kind of dippy eggs um, or those over easy eggs in the morning um, or any time of the day as well. Um, but really that could be a, a source for unsafe food. And then of course our dairy products. So that just means we don't wanna leave those unrefrigerated or at temperature in the refrigerator. Um, on here, I also mentioned a little bit about thawing methods. So the three best ways for you to do that. Um, one is going to be under cold running water. So we really don't want to put that food that we're thawing out into a bowl on the counter of water that's just sitting still and just kind of forget about it. It should be running continuously. If you don't want to do that, not a problem. You can stick it in the refrigerator. You know, great for planning ahead. If you can put it in the refrigerator the day before, then it's good to go the next day. You know, maybe you forgot to do that or you really didn't know what you wanted to eat the next day. So you can always do it in the microwave on the defrost setting as well. Um, and then lastly, you know, with, with the picnics that I just mentioned and, and having leftover foods, um, you always want to have the two hour rule. So you should discard any perishable items left out at room temperature um, for more than two hours. Now, of course, if you're keeping it cold, so if you're keeping it on ice, um, you know, either at a picnic or, or leftovers were in the refrigerator for something, um, you know, that's perfectly fine. It's going to be okay or if you're keeping it warm. So sometimes you can have like a little burner under it um, if, if you're out. Um, but again, room temperature, if it's sitting out, don't have it more than two hours. So I just talked a lot about healthy options, uh, what to eat, where to put it. Um, but again, th those are all great. But you first have to have access to the food, right? So maybe you didn't get to the grocery store. Maybe your pantry's not very um, stocked right now. So your next option would just say, hey, 
we're going to eat out, all right? Maybe you worked a long day. You can't think about going home and cooking either. Um, you want to grab something. There are healthy ways to do this, all right? Also, we need to remember to look at the big picture, all right? Some days you won't be making a smart choice, but as long as you don't have it as an everyday occurrence, um, you can still be on the right track. So when eating out, you can always choose healthier options. I shouldn't say always, but most of the time, you can choose healthier options as well. And a few ways to do that um, are planning ahead, right? So you look at the menu online. So many restaurants now are posting their calorie information. Um, and sometimes you can actually get more than just calorie information if they have a more extensive list um, about each one of their dishes and how many calories, how many fats, you know, things like that. So you can always look online to see if that's available. And this really is um, a mandatory for um, any chain restaurant that has over 20 locations. So, you know, the little local shops uh, aren't required to do this at all. But again, those big ones you can always check out. Um, and again, if, if you get an item that you know will last you more than one meal and it's at a good price, say it's either on sale or, you know, it's a buy one, get one, something like that, having leftovers is a great option um, for, that, for that decent price. Um, if you also get uh, an item out, excuse me, and it's very large portioned. I mean, how many restaurants do you go to <clears throat> and um, you, get, you get double of what you should be eating, right? You know, take it home, have those leftovers, a great option. And then the last thing to kind of figure out if it's going to be a healthy option when you're eating out is really those descriptive words. So aiming for something that says, you know, it's grilled or it's steamed or the word fresh, something like that, it's going to be most likely a healthier option. Um, but if you see kind of written on anywhere on the menu and it says fried or battered, you know, the word smothered, something like that, usually it's going to um, not be as great of an option as something else on the menu that you can find. Um, and the other thing that I wanted to mention um, for having smart food choices is anything that's um, in addition to the nutrition assistance program. So these are going to be things like SNAP and WIC. Um, so they are healthy options that you can choose while participating in assistance programs. And then buying uh, and then by using some of these tips, hopefully you learned today and we can keep talking about, will help in your decision making. Um, so this, if this is something you're interested in more, um, I can certainly dive deeper if any questions come about. Um, but these programs also offer farmer market vouchers to help increase access to fresh fruits and veggies. Um, and then if you've ever heard of Food Bucks, so the Food Trust has a program called Food Bucks, um, and you can redeem these at participating stores for fruits and vegetables. For every $5 you spend using SNAP benefits, you actually get $2 back in Food Bucks. And then on the next slide, I show you where you can actually get these. But again, by making smart food choices, it goes beyond just what you buy or cook. It's also about making smart choices when eating out and using benefits of other assistance programs too. All right, so on here, we have some local food programs and community resources. Um, so of course, the Center of Life um, is gonna have the food delivery meals, dry food boxes and produce boxes with a phone um, and website. Fishes and Lowe's has those Meals on Wheels, congregate lunches, emergency food boxes, again, with a phone number and website to check out. The Hazelwood YMCA Food Pantry, um, Saturdays at the Spartan Center, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think those are monthly, not weekly, right? Correct. Okay. Yeah. And then Dialamato's Market, they're going to have local and fresh, healthy foods, and they're ones in the area that accept food bucks. Um, so not only do they accept food bucks, but they actually, I believe, um, with that, with that snap return, can give you a couple back. And then the Holy Cross Lutheran Chapel has the food distribution, and St. John's has a food distribution as well. So some items where you can actually get um, some food access in your local community. And one of the things that the Center for Integrative Health is doing, and myself too, is really trying to partner with some of these organizations to see, um, you know, what do those donated items look like? Can we can we package up a healthy box for um, residents? Can we see what the what the food bank, you know, and partnering with them are um, being able able to to donate as well. So really, I think, you know, access to these programs and this food, you're going to have um, sometimes where maybe one is healthier than the other, but really overall, it's just getting some of that into the residents who need it as well. 
I also want to mention real quick something else that the um, Center for Integrative Health here at Duquesne is doing. Um, so it's called Prescription for Change. And this study is really improving the chronic diseases um, of and health outcomes of Hazelwood residents. Um, so if you have a chronic disease, so that would be the high blood pressure, prediabetes, or diabetes, um, you may be eligible to participate in this prescription for change. And what you would do is that you meet with a pharmacist about every three months. And we come right there into Hazelwood. Um, so you wouldn't have to worry about coming on campus or up to Duquesne at all. Um, and we would follow up with you for one year. And we do have you enrolled in educational classes based on which chronic disease you may have. And so we would be teaching all about these healthy habits and physical activity and making good choices and um, you know, really having kind of that group support as well. And that's what I mentioned the food bucks is that you can actually earn up to $450 in food bucks um, to spend on those healthy foods. So that would be any of those fruits and vegetables right there at Dial Amato's that you could use it at. Um, we also are offering prizes for participation. Um, so again, blood pressure cuffs, scales, fitness tractors, kitchen cookware, um, so many more, um, anything to make you um, successful in trying to help um, improve your healthy lifestyle choices. So I also want to mention too that this was, you know, the the first one that I did as far as the wellness workshops for the Center of Life, and I and I love talking about it. But it was just basically a general overview of maybe some things that you might be interested in. So if there really is anything specifically you want to talk about, you know, pick my brain, you know, talk about it in the group session, anything like that. There's always um, ideas that I would love to keep doing. So, you know, could it be cooking together or sharing recipes? Maybe we go into a store and we kind of walk around and find some good items. You know, we really didn't talk about portions or other nutrients today other than what was on the food label. So we can really dive deep into some of those other areas. You know, we can talk about chronic disease management if you have any of those conditions as well and kind of what eating around those and planning smart would look like. And of course, anything else you think of that actually I would be able to talk about, you know, if I'm not the right person, then maybe we can find somebody else. But again, anything you're interested in, um, I'd rather give you information that you want rather than me just talking just to talk. Um, but again, my name's Marla, and here's my contact information. If you have any questions, you can always call or email me. Um, but I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen now and see if there's any questions that kind of come up. Um, I do have several handouts that actually um, I'm going to follow up with that you can have um, to either maybe print out or have, um, you know, emailed to you, whatever it is, if you want some of the kind of things that I talked about today. Hi, Marla. Um, I did have a question. Can you talk a little bit about like portions, um, like, like how much of each um, um, like like meat and grains or whatever should you eat a day, right? So I guess like if you're cooking your own food, you don't have the benefit of having the box there, but but say like like you know if you're cooking fried chicken or if you're cooking baked chicken or whatever, like how many pieces of chicken should you eat or how much potatoes should you eat or how much green beans should you eat? That kind of thing. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it's a great question. And again, I can give you a specific, you know, you should only be eating a half a cup of your potatoes and you should only be eating four ounces of your meat. You know, that's definitely something that you can take away and you can measure it all out if you want to and you can be very, very precise. Um, if you don't have the time to do that or if that's not something that you're interested in as far as um, you know, taking the time to do that and cutting and weighing and things like that, a really great simple way um, to, to figure out portion size is to use that plate again. So if you can really try and think of your plate, a, a dinner plate, um, as half of it should be fruits and vegetables, your protein should be a very small source, your grains and your dairy, a good way to think of it. Now, if that's too, you know, uh, uh, too wide of a concept. Again, we got, we got lots of different ends, either very, very detailed or very general. Um, you can also use your hand. It's crazy how many different ways um, your hand can help control portion sizes. So if you make just like a cup, a small cup, 
that's that palm area is going to be a half of a cup if you're thinking about a measuring container in itself. Um, your whole kind of palm laid out, that should be about the size of, you know, a fillet of fish if you're thinking about it. And maybe if it's a thicker cut of meat, a little bit smaller than the whole, you know, palm of your hand. Um, your thumb is equal to a tablespoon. So that's a good way to measure out what a tablespoon is actually worth. Um, and I think that's kind of the majority of what your hand can tell you. Um, but thinking about other sizes of um, common household um, items could also help you kind of visualize what, you know, actually five ounces of, of meat look like. Um, or if you're thinking about having three to five servings of those grains. Um, so again, it can be very specific to numbered base, or we can kind of um, make it up. Uh, I shouldn't say make it up as we go, but, you know, use, use other items to try and make it easier to, to visualize. Did that answer your question? It did. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, and I'll definitely make sure I share um, my kind of number resource with you. So if you do want specifics for that, I'll definitely have that shared with um, Devon and Konomi as well. Oh, I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, earlier, my daughter came over unexpected. My apologies. But, I didn't um, even notice. So I'll go. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> I have two questions. So when you were mentioning about the um, food staying out for two hours, mm -hmm. does that also, um, like if you're going to the grocery store, you know how sometimes you go to multiple stores and you might have your raw meat, that two hours applies for that too? Yes, it would. So if you take, say, let's um, use the example of meat at one grocery store mm -hmm. and it's in your car, and then you go to another grocery store before you're coming home. If you're within that two hour window, still perfectly fine, right? Especially if it was a frozen meat product, you got a little bit more leeway, right? So if it's a frozen item and you're a little bit more than two hours, again, I'm not too concerned about that. But if you're getting some, some kind of fresh um, meat product or specifically dairy, I would be a little bit more careful on those items too. Okay. Good to know. And mm -hmm. I just have one other. I'm a snacker. So I always just go for the quick things like chips. So if you maybe could have some sort of um, healthy options for, you know, a substitute of chips and cookies and <laughs> all that good stuff that, you know, in a future meeting, contact, whatever, I would find that helpful. Absolutely. So we could we could talk a whole other time on healthy snack options, but just to give you a, a little answer right now as well, and I'll definitely note that down. Um, you know, anything that you have in the house or that's easy to grab or already portioned out in, in bite-sized pieces, you know, that's definitely going to be something that's very easy to grab. Um, so trying to make other foods into that snack-sized option is very helpful. So so if you can pre-cut any of your vegetables or your fruits and make them bite-sized and easy to eat instead of those chips, that's going to be helpful. Um, but even kind of getting them out of the house, I know there might be more than, I mean, you already mentioned a daughter. So if there's more than one of you in the house, you know, you got to try and buy for everybody. So that's also going to be hard to do. Um, but yes, we can certainly talk um, a lot more about that. She might've lost connection. I think unfortunately we, we lost Miss Danielle there, but I'm 100% the same way and I have to get rid of all of the snacks in my house or I will go looking for them at all hours of the day. And then it just ends up being me just like opening the fridge a hundred different times. <laughs> in there but yeah <laughs> yep yep if it's there you know it so i'll write that down for healthy snacking ideas as well but i'll see if i can find something to email to you too well i uh, i took up more time than i maybe thought i would so thank you so much for everybody to um ask questions and i liked the conversation going back and forth in the chat box as well um, you know, if you haven't eaten dinner yet, hopefully you can take some of what I said today and kind of make something up this evening or um, think about kind of how you're fueling yourself. Um, and then, you know, any questions you got, I'm, I'm always here. So if we want to do something more in the future, you know, we can always talk about that later. But um, 
again, I love this and thank you for the opportunity. And um, you know, hopefully uh, we can share it with more people too. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Marla. Thank you. Thank you everyone mm -hmm. who joined. Thank you. Bye. Have a good evening. Bye.